It was suggested that I do a club presentation of the kayak trip that Dave Ressler and I undertook last summer. And while I love to talk paddling, I was hesitant to do a presentation on this trip because I just didn't have many decent slides to show you. You see, I had one video camera fail prior to the trip and then three out of four of our remaining cameras died during the first week. Additionally, we had an impressive list of critical gear that had to be repaired or otherwise accommodated, and most of our battery-powered electronics struggled to stay alive or just outright died. Now, with regards to cameras, Dave has the best camera, has the best feel for composition, and consistently takes the best images. So when his failed on day one, I knew that I'd have to step up. I had my own camera problems though, right? But since I paddled the area numerous times, I have other images to use as filler. So I made an executive decision to plug some of them in whenever site appropriate. So with all this whining behind us, I present to you the Clem 2 to Port Hardy Central Coast Carhartt Duct Tape Tour. First, a bit of info about the outer coast of BC for anyone unfamiliar with it. It's broken into three sections, north, central, and west coast. The west coast is really the outer coast of Vancouver Island. The north coast encompasses Hecate Strait from roughly Prince Rupert to Seaforth Channel, and the central coast runs from Seaforth Channel to Cape Caution. Our route would take us 226 miles from Clem 2 to Port Hardy, from the southern edge of the north coast down the length of the central coast. We were out for 24 days, but only paddled for 15. We took eight days off due to high winds and seas, and one decent day off to perform equipment repairs. The drive from Everett to Port Hardy takes about 12 hours, including a ferry ride from Tawasson to Nanaimo. We arrived in Port Hardy around 2.30 in the afternoon or so and had some time to burn, so we went to Carrot Waterfront Park where we tackled the first of our equipment repairs. The fast text tabs that hold Dave's underdeck bag had come loose, so we broke out the sandpaper and contact cement and re-glued them. In the morning, we parked the truck at Bear Cove and boarded the Northern Expedition. It runs between Port Hardy and Prince Rupert every other day. On most runs, it stops at Bella Bella, but once a week, it stops at Clem Two. Since you'll be walking on, you'll board first. A veteran's tip here is to follow the signs up to the Aurora Lounge and nab one of the high back captain's chairs in front of the floor to ceiling windows outside of the lounge. Choose the starboard side and take your charts with you. The ferry ride to Clem 2 is all during daylight hours and the scenery is spectacular. Arriving in Clem 2, the ferry backs into the dock and the kayak trailer's wheeled off. The trailer isn't always used, and when it isn't, you'll have to hand carry your boat. The launch is beneath the dock, and it's a real dog. It's awkward to access and extremely bony. The trick is to arrive during a rising tide, load your boat on the rocks, and let the tide rise to float it. This is an image from a previous trip in 2012. The ragged barnacle-covered rocks took their toll this year in scraped gel coat, banged forehead, bloody knuckles, swollen toe, and twisted knee. The bloody knuckles were bandaged up with duct tape. The ideal strategy here is to ride the last of the flood north up Tolmy Channel, arriving at split head at the turn to ebb. From there, you ride the ebb south, then west through Myers Passage to Laredo Sound. I've never gotten it right. With our boats loaded, we made our escape. This is one of the few photos that Dave got before his camera failed. The route takes us north up Tolmy Channel, where we hang a left into Myers Passage. Myers Passage is a beautiful place. I wouldn't know it till I got home, but my spot device was not working consistently. More Myers Passage beauty. Our first camp, 
Tombolo camp is behind that eyelet on the left. Tombolo camp is where my land camera started dying a slow and painful death. Dave's cockpit was leaking like crazy. My toe hurt. It was a calm morning at Tombolo camp. My toe was so swollen and tender that I could barely get my shoe on. Morning on Myers Passage. The good weather wouldn't last long. We explored McCray Cove looking for a kayak bill camp. The rain started in and the winds and seas built during the day. We completed the last hour of our paddle with winds gusting 15 to 20 knots, two foot swells and three foot wind waves. If you keep your eyes open, you'll see lots of history of the Kittisu Heihei occupation. This is a picture of the landing on Milne Island where we spent our second night. I was having more spot device challenges. The cuff of one sleeve of Dave's dry suit had come unstitched. The gasket was fine, but the stitching had failed. Dave's camera crossed the Rainbow Bridge and was declared dead on Milne Island. From Milne Island, our route would take us across Kittisu Bay and on to Brown Bear Camp on Higgins Passage. We crossed Kittisu Bay to Wilby Point in sporting conditions, where we stopped to search for one of Kayak Bill's camps, which has eluded me. No luck, so we continued on to Higgins Passage. The campsite at Higgins Passage is one of my favorites, and it has killer sunsets. While there, we discovered some holes in the body of Dave's new Hubba Hubba NX that we patched with tenacious tape. My land camera started calling for constant battery changes, freezing up or shutting off. Fresh batteries didn't help. I declared it dead. My spot device checked in and out, reporting the position about half the time. I put new batteries in it. So it goes. Since we've returned, this campsite has been closed due to overuse. In the morning, we wanted to collect some water, and there's this salmon stream that I know about. We arrived near low tide and found the shoreline and stream bed covered with dead, headless salmon. The Price Island coastal wolves had seen us coming and abandoned the site of the massacre just ahead of our arrival. Sea wolves eat only the heads of the salmon and leave the rest for other animals. Their feast had started during the night at high tide and they had followed the retreating water until we arrived. These fish were still dripping blood. We started counting dead fish, but gave up and estimated that there were about 200 of them. So how many wolves does it take to catch and eat the heads off of 200 salmon? Dave walked upstream above the previous evening's high tide and gathered some bags of water for me to filter. This is decent quality water for the Great Bear Rainforest. Very little tannin. Paddling to the east end of Higgins Passage, we come to Pidwell Beach. It has a reliable stream at its west end. The beach sits behind Pidwell Reefs, which break most of the fury that Millbank Sound can throw at it. Susan Conrad once described Millbank Sound as a fussy body of water. I have to agree. There's no upland camping here, so you're on the sand at all tides and up in the logs during springs, which was our case. We had visited several times before, but never stayed the night. We were both curious what this would look like at the highest tide of the summer and decided to stick around and find out. There were three small spots that we thought would remain dry with the predicted tide, winds, and barometric pressure. If we were wrong, we could simply throw our stuff up into the bushes and wait for the tide to subside. At 1 a.m., we were up to watch the high slack under a beautiful full moon. Waves came up around my little perch, and it was pretty fun to watch. My spot had devoured another fresh set of batteries. So, Pidwell to Dallas Island for lunch, and then on to Gale Passage. 
Rather than travel through Gale Passage in the morning, we wanted to see a section of Athlone Island that was new to both of us, so instead we camped at Cape Mark. Dallas Island is a nice place to camp. Up until Kayak Bill's death in December of 2003, this was one of his primary camps. I first explored it a few years after his death, and it featured an amazing and complex boardwalk system across the island. Two years later, the boardwalk had been taken over by the jungle, and his camp was being destroyed by power boaters who seemed to think that aluminum cans were compostable. Continuing south, we arrived at the Hiltzik cabin on Gale Passage near Low Slack. Very low. Too low to gracefully get out of my boat in front of the cabin, so I just sat there and waited for the tide to lift me up to a decent spot to exit. My GPS had eaten another set of batteries, so I switched it to battery save mode. Dave's GPS died altogether and would not acquire f satellites. Fresh batteries didn't help. Dave slept in the cabin. I slept in the tent. Paddling down the outer coast of the Bardswells, you'll arrive at Cape Mark, which is the southwesternmost point of the island group. This is where I ran into Bill Porter in 2017 when he, Chris Smith, and Rob Freelove shared the beach and their company with me. This is Bill's image from that trip taken just outside the campsite shortly after I arrived. The paddler is Chris Smith. At high tide, the view from the beach looks like this. Access is unlimited. At low tide, it looks like this. It's a nice place to camp, but access is tide dependent. We wouldn't launch until afternoon. Here we see the bottom of the Bard's Wells and the obvious route from Cape Mark to Islet 48 and on to Sneaker Cabin. At the south end of the Bard's Wells is Sneaker Cabin, which I found on Google Earth. Unfortunately, it's dilapidated and overgrown, but there's a small point that will survive most tides. Once again, we had our alarm set so that we'd be awake at high tide. On this evening, it survived by inches. However, the sterns of our boats floated. Equipment update. The stitching of the security harness for my spot device failed, so I couldn't secure it. I broke out a needle and thread from my repair materials and stitched it up. Also, my GoPro froze up and stayed that way until it burned through the battery charge. Then it wouldn't take a charge. So out of four cameras, only one was still above dirt. The tide goes way out here, so in the morning it looked like this and this, and this, but eventually we got off the beach and were on our way. First stop was for water on Iroquois Island in the tribal group. You have to know where to look and then you listen for water trickling in the woods. Getting in and out of the boats here is awkward too. Nisketeer Marie Mills camped here by clinging to the hillside back in the 90s. This is the clinging campsite that Marie Mills and her group used. All four of them crowded into that bug tent. I filtered water while Dave tended the boats. The water here isn't convenient, but it is reliable. Lots of tannin, but it's, it's good enough for who it's for. Heading south from Iroquois to Cultus Sound via the Simmons Group, it started out clear and then fog developed. Our intended route's in red. Yellow is actual. You can see where we entered the fog and started navigating by compass instead of VFR. We held a decent heading and only deviated from it when we were avoiding something. So whenever we saw or heard waves breaking, we cheated left so as not to end up in the middle of Queen Sound. Eventually, we found that we had been cheating left from a large, noisy tide race that had pushed us east, and we ended up spending some time in it. Not scary, but unexpected. The fog and currents conspired to put us two miles off course so that when we finally entered the Simmons group, we were actually entering the McNaughton group. We handrailed down the McNaughtons in fog and current and managed to arrive in Cultus Sound, where we met up with Barb and George Gronseth from the Kayak Academy. 
They were on a paddle about with close friends and had come across Queen's Sound from Goose. We shared the beach with them and saw them off in the morning. Cultus is a pretty nice beach, protected, reasonably large with upland camping. Barb says hi. Niska's own David Desert Spring was there. So after leaving Cultus Sound, we encountered a pleasure boater in Swordfish Bay. He told us that a powerful system was bringing southeasterly winds of 40 to 45 knots after dark. So we needed a campsite that was sheltered from winds and offered upland camping. SCSI camp fit the bill. Though Tricat is a culturally sensitive site, there is a northwest facing beach that has been road hard and put away wet for decades. We knew that due to the impending weather conditions and our choice of the island's least favorable beach, the Hiltzik would understand. Here's the chart covering Cultus Sound to Scuzzy Camp with stops at Swordfish Bay, Edna Islands, and finally Tricat Island. Swordfish Bay is a favorite of mine. You wouldn't know that something so strong was coming, but come it did. It arrived suddenly and brought high winds and rain for the next two days. In 1977, Randall Washburn built his first cabin on the coast at this Triquette Beach. He would go on and build a couple more coastal shelters, one in the deserters, plus the fabled enchanted cabin at Burnett Bay. In 2005, I spent a few nights in this Triquette cabin, but it was very rough then. I didn't return until 2017, and it was on the verge of collapse. Here we are in 2017. I won't be sleeping in there. So in August 2023, it looked like this. See that big white plastic thing? I drug it up from the beach to close off a window from rain during a storm in 2005. I can't believe that it was still there 18 years later. Winds and rain kept us at SCSI camp for three nights. When we were finally getting ready to launch, Dave found that the joint of his cypress was broken. He considered duct taping it together, but instead switched to his Aikilos. Due to bad weather, it took us a week to travel from Cultus Sound to Safety Cove. That's a distance easily covered in three days or two if you push it. After a slightly busy transit of Kildit Sound, we arrived at Calvert Island, which, in my opinion, has the most and best beaches on the BC coast. This is Wolf Beach in the Choke Passage Complex. It's the most accessible of Calvert's beaches and sees the most traffic. First-timers typically camp at the east end, but the west end is much more protected and preferred. The west end has a hard stop to protect you, while the east end has a better view but no protection whatsoever. As Dave was pulling off his dry suit, he tore a wrist gasket. That gave us something to do for the rest of the day. Digging into his well-stocked repair kit, he extracted a replacement gasket, aqua seal, and duct tape. We found that my jet boil stove with the neoprene insulation removed was the perfect size tool for that repair. Not ready to put his tape away, Dave turned to his sandals that were delaminating front and back. It should be noted that he purchased these sandals over a decade ago and that this particular pair is the very definition of worn out. He was on a repair roll, so he taped them back together. So while suiting up in the morning, I tore my neck gasket. No worries, we had aqua seal and duct tape and a day to relax. When we were done with my neck gasket, we started in on Dave's cockpit rim that we thought might be leaking. What the heck? We had the time and plenty of duct tape. After that, we both read and wrote. My neck gasket repair was a success, so we set off through Quakshawa Channel to Fitzhugh Sound. From there, we intended to cross Fitzhugh to Addenbrooke Light Station and point south. The sea state was unsuitable for that, though, with winds to 15 knots, one meter swells, three foot chop. I suggested that we go five nautical miles north or downwind to sheltered Goldstream Harbor, but Dave wanted to go south to Safety Cove. 
It took us five hours to paddle the eight nautical miles into conditions to get there. Something you should know about Safety Cove is that there are no good campsites. Consequently, we ended up doing a seated dry suit bivy between a couple of logs. We set up my tarp for the rain and used Dave's tarp for a blanket. Limited success in breaking the wind and rain that blew through the night. I wore my spray skirt around my neck for added insulation. In the morning, the wind and rain stopped and we had nice conditions for crossing Fitzhugh Sound. Beautiful morning. Light and variable winds increased to northwest at 15 knots, generating moderate seas, but decent conditions for making 19 nautical miles to Cranstown Point. Cranstown Point has good beaches on both sides, which means you should always be able to find a surf-free beach to land on. This is the north beach where we landed. At the far end, there's a great stream. There's also a cool cabin for two that was built by our friends and Nanaimo paddlers. It has two large windows and a skylight, an excellent stove, and two comfy bunks. This is a south beach facing out into Queen Charlotte Sound. We spent three nights here while the northwest winds blew at 15 to 25 knots, creating rough seas with two meter swells and three foot wind waves. Daytime temps were in the 70s. It gave Dave time to do permanent sandal repairs with Aquaseal. Our goal was to make it something over 14 nautical miles from Cranstown Point to Indian Cove. There are some moving parts along this stretch of coastline and we wanted friendly conditions. What we got were winds to 15 knots, two meter swells with two foot wind waves and fog. The conditions at first were very nice from Cranstown Point to Table Island, but do you see those lenticular clouds forming over the coast range? Those are harbingers of things to come. Crossing Smith Sound was mostly a breeze, but as fog developed, we shifted back to navigating by map, compass, and sound. We found Milthrop Point by sound and followed our ears south past Hoop Bay and around Neck Nass. This was a two-hour exercise in squint and listen navigation. It was pretty trying, and once we felt certain that we had located the mouth of Indian Cove, we made an invigorating entry through the rocks and whitewater to the beach. It was a yahoo ride. Indian Cove is separated from Blunden Bay by a narrow isthmus. Blunden Bay is quite large and adjacent to Cape Caution, and in these conditions, the Cape don't play. This is Indian Cove looking north. We would spend four identical days here while it blew 15 to 20 knots and generated rough seas. Conditions too strong, we felt, for the long push we'd need to get around Cape Caution, across Slingsby Channel, across Braham Bay to Shelter Bay, which was our staging point for crossing Queen Charlotte Strait. There is only one upland clearing that will hold two tents here. Write that down and don't use Indian Co. for a larger group except at NEEPS. On our first day at Indian Cove, we were visited by a brown bear. I knew something was up when Dave started searching for words and speaking in tongues. To look fearsome, he picked up the biggest stick he could find. In his most menacing but soft-spoken way, he started suggesting that the bear go away. I had a different strategy, though, that incorporated aggression with defense. I figured that no bear with a lick of sense would challenge a screaming warrior clad for battle wearing a helmet and PFD, armed with bear spray, a Gerber River shorty, a whistle, and a poop shovel. I know that I was loud and fearsome looking, and in my own mind, I'm convinced that I drove him off. But the reality is that he flopped down on some bones of a seal that he had set aside for a snack and chewed contentedly while I jumped up and down and yelled bad things about his mother. With Dave dashing about trying to effect an emergency bear hang and me acting as if possessed by a demon who couldn't dance, he sauntered towards us, and when he was just 20 feet from Dave, he stuck his nose into his smelly sleeping bag that was laying out to air. He recoiled sharply, turned, and abruptly disappeared into the forest. 
We continued wearing our armor and brandishing our weapons for the rest of the day. From time to time, I would shout bare profanities and then go back to whatever it was I was doing. The weather continued to be clear and windy outside of our cove while we took stock of the balance of our remaining water, food supplies, and the next leg against current conditions and long-range weather forecasts. Our next safe haven would be Shelter Bay, and that route can be a bone to chew. So there was nothing to do but waste some more duct tape and plan our next move. And read and write. Our meals and water were running low, and we were unsure when we would get off the beach and back to Port Hardy. We had enough calories to consume for another week, but regular food was almost gone. We agreed to go on half rations, and I would cut out all coffee consumption until we could get to water. Note that Dave is still carrying his bear spray. And then one day, Dave went for a walk and found a seat where water was collecting in the rocks. The coffee ban was finally lifted. It was pretty dark, even for coastal standards, but it was good enough for who it was for. As one weather day ran into the next, we watched the seas outside of our safe cove and listened to the weather reports. After four days, conditions were forecast to weaken. It was suggested that winds would moderate to northwest at 10 to 15 knots with two meter swells and two foot wind waves. We would take it. We were off the beach at a reasonable hour and were greeted by the promised 10 to 15 knot winds and associated sea state. Fun stuff working our way out through the mouth of the cove in thick fog with lots of noise from wind and waves. Rounding Cape Caution with wind against current and low visibility was a real treat. Busy work, lots going on. Fog cleared as we approached Burnett Bay, but was building again at the far end. Mist generated from large waves breaking on the long beach could be seen rising 100 feet into the air as a low rumble and thumping carried out to sea. Nearing the mouth of Slingsby Channel, confused currents mixed, creating waves that crossed and peaked weirdly, and it was all in fog. When the water weirdness backed down, we figured that we were across the mouth of the channel, so we assumed the planned compass heading and paddled on into the grayness. After a while, though, I wasn't believing what the compass was saying and needed to turn on the GPS to find out where we really were, but when the screen came up, it was frozen. Its batteries were too low to tell us any more than good luck, suckers. If you've done much paddling in whiteout conditions, you know that weird feeling you get and how easy it is to disbelieve your instruments and chase light. It wasted me. Emotionally and intellectually, I was exhausted. I asked Dave to take over. He assumed our original heading and off we went. For me, it was suddenly like I was on vacation, as all I had to do was follow his boat and look around. The fog, though thick, was a shallow layer, so lots of sun came through and painted everything in brilliant shades of silver. Swell height had increased and was crossing from two directions, signifying, I assume, that we were in the outflow of Schooner Channel. We passed through large mounds of moving, sparkling silver water that hissed but didn't break. It was fabulous, and just when I thought things couldn't get any better, a humpback could be heard approaching from out of the fog. It surfaced three times before I spotted it about 40 feet away, its body encrusted with barnacles moving in slow motion and glistening in the magic silver light. Rivulets running down its back added more reflective interest. Its tail rose, dripping diamonds, and then slipped beneath the sea. Shortly after that, the fog cleared, and we were exactly where we wanted to be. We slipped behind Southgate Island and paddled another hour or two along the coast to Shelter Bay. It was a 21 nautical mile day that took us 12 and a half hours to paddle. We were hot to get across Queen Charlotte Strait, but at 4 a.m. the forecast was for winds 10 to 15 knots, swell to 2.5 meter with 2 foot wind waves. Hearing that crossing the Queen would involve managing 9 foot combined seas made it really easy for me to roll over and go back to sleep. 
So we spent another day on another beach waiting for conditions to allow us to go home. It was warm and cozy on our beach, but was beyond sporty out in the strait. The 4 a.m. weather forecast called for winds to be light and variable. By 6.40 a.m. we had dumped our excess water, eaten the last of our rationed oatmeal, and headed across Queen Charlotte Strait for Port Hardy. The crossing of Queen Charlotte Strait from Shelter Bay to Port Hardy is about 15 nautical miles. It breaks down into three significant crossings and one final slog. The first crossing is about five and a half nautical miles from Shelter Bay to the passage between the Walker and Deserter groups. The crossing of Gordon Channel from the Deserters to Bell Island is only three nautical miles, but it's the most problematic in my opinion. Then you cross Galitas Channel from Bell to Duval Point on Vancouver Island, which isn't a big deal unless the wind is up. Finally, there's a three nautical mile longest slog across Hardy Bay to the ferry terminal at Bear Cove. Skies were overcast and visibility was unlimited. After three days of strong weather and drama, it felt odd to have such great conditions for the crossing. It was just amazingly quiet and peaceful out there. The water was glassy and thick. In spite of the benevolent conditions, the queen always has the last word. On this crossing, she blessed us with a strong and visible ebb current in Gordon Channel that ripped us right off of our course sideways. The current in mid-channel could not be overcome, so it was a long, hard ferry glide to the rugged shore of Bell Island, where the current was slowed just enough for us to make headway against it. By 3 p.m., the boats were loaded on the truck and we started home, arriving in Everett 12 hours later. This was an interesting trip that was planned to be laid back with no particular route and days off whenever we felt like taking one. Neither of us were in paddling condition and we expected to hurt. It turned out that we took more forced weather days on this trip than on all of my eight previous BC coastal trips combined, and conditioning wasn't an issue. All days off except for one were due to high winds and seas. On the days we paddled, we experienced three clear days, three rainy days, three overcast days, and six foggy days. Average peak winds were 16 knots. Average combined seas were four feet. We had 11 gear failures, seven of which we were able to resolve. We suffered 13 abrasions and contusions that were resolved with skin glue, duct tape, and ibuprofen. We had six unresolved failures of electronic gear. Our charts and compasses worked perfectly. We went through a whole roll of duct tape. That concludes the presentation. Are there any questions?